Welcome to the Adoption and Foster Care Journey, a podcast to encourage, educate, and equip you to care for children and youth through adoption, foster, and kinship care. Hosted by an adoptive mom with over 22 years of kinship and adoptive parenting experience, she's on this journey with you. Please welcome Sandra Flack. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. That is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. That's what we're all about around here. I'm your host, Sandra Flack. Welcome to this episode of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey. I am grateful uh, to have you joining me today. It's my honor to offer you some encouragement, equip you a little bit, and uh, journey with you, really, um, as you are parenting your kiddos from hard places. Um, Raising kids with trauma, difficult, right, to say the least. Uh, And, you know, add to that prenatal exposure to alcohol or other drugs, makes it all the more difficult. Um, And in a lot of ways, I think it's because it's an invisible disability, actually. Um, So they, you know, you can't tell that there's actually a brain-based reason for the big behaviors that our kiddos exhibit. Um, And I know how you feel. I'm also a parent on this journey Um, So you're not alone. And there's a whole community of us, fellow parents and caregivers, who are also on this journey. And actually, check out this resource that we have for you. Sandra Flack, host of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey podcast and FASD educator, Debbie Raymond, invite you to join Hope for the FASD Journey, a virtual support community for parents and caregivers raising individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, diagnosed or not. This faith-based support community meets online three times each month, features special VIP guests, and a private Facebook group for members only, which includes Soul Care Saturday video devotionals led by Sandra and Deb. Both Sandra and Deb are adoptive moms raising kids with FASD and facilitators of the FACETS neurobehavioral model. For details and to register, visit justicefororphansny.org forward slash hope hyphen community. That's justicefororphansny.org forward slash hope hyphen community. And, you know, we don't, this is, this podcast isn't solely about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. It's not the only thing we talk about, but we do talk about it a lot um, because of the prevalence and, you know, among, among the population of children in adoptive placements in foster care, even kinship, right? Um, There's a high prevalence of prenatal exposure to alcohol um, as well as other drugs, but alcohol does the most harm, uh, longer lasting harm. And a lot of parents and professionals even don't realize that FASD is the leading cause of developmental disabilities and learning disabilities worldwide. Uh, In fact, one in 20 school-aged children in the United States has been prenatally exposed to alcohol. Um, That's a higher rate than autism, which is one in 36. Uh, And of course, it's even more prevalent among our population of children in child welfare. Um, And families are struggling. We are struggling, you know, whether so many families don't know that that is actually what they're struggling with. And even if you do know, it doesn't necessarily make it any easier, right? I'm a mom of an 18 and a 21 year old with fetal alcohol syndrome diagnosed. And I spent years trying to figure out what was going on and how could I help my kids and how could I fix this behavior and change this behavior? And, you know, we became trauma informed. That's a very necessary part of this journey. Um, 
used all the connected parenting strategies, which worked. And I highly endorse love Dr. Karen Purvis, the connected child, the whole thing. Right. Um, but we reached a point to where that wasn't enough. We needed next level um, skills and strategies and to be better equipped and to really understand the impact um, and how literally our kids' brains are completely different because of prenatal exposure. Um, and the journey is isolating because people don't get it. Um, back then when my kids got diagnosed, we got handed a pamphlet on ADHD by the developmental pediatrician. And we were told, you know, have a nice day. There, there was not a community. There was, there was no support there. There really was no resources back then. It was just dark and doom and gloom outcomes. So now I offer, um, FASD resources that I would have never even dreamed of having back then. So you heard about the um, hope for the FASD journey support community. I also do one-on-one -on -one parent coaching on FASD um, and online and in-person workshops and training. Um, I travel, I teach just, just in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be going out to the Western part of New York state um, to do a breakout session at a conference for Christian educators. Um, so lots of ways that we can get the word out and, and um, we can really advocate for our community. Uh, so for you listening, I do have some trainings coming up if you feel like you need to learn a little bit more about FASD. Um, so before I get to our guest, because we do have a guest today, I do want to tell you about a couple things coming up right quick on the calendar. Uh, Thursday, August 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern time, I'm offering an online three-hour FASD workshop where I'll unpack the impact of prenatal exposure to alcohol, the symptoms, um, and how to take a brain-based approach uh, to caring for our kids, supporting and accommodating our kids, um, all using the facets neurobehavioral model, which I am a, a trained facilitator of. Um, and if you really want to go deep, I'm offering a deep dive in October. So it's uh, not too late to get on, uh, to get registered for that one. Um, this is 18 hours worth of content. We spread it out over six sessions, one three hour session each week, uh, starting at the beginning of October. Uh, so um, that uses the neurobehavioral model as well. Uh, and we offer uh, uh, certificates of completion for every one of our trainings, um, as well as if you happen to be a licensed social worker in New York State, we do offer CEUs as well. So check out all of these resources on our website at justicefororphansny.org, uh, and, and you can get connected and sign up um, for those. Also, I'd love for you to check out my personal website where I blog. I've been doing a whole series of blog posts, one per symptom or characteristic of FASD. So there's like 10 posts up there right now. Um, and you can just kind of take your time if you're, if you want to learn more about executive dysfunction, um, if you want to learn more about um, impulse control problems, uh, dismaturity, just all of these different symptoms of FASD, um, I dedicate a blog post to each one. So you can read those and find out more over at sandraflack.com. And there's a link in the show notes to both of our websites. And of course, um, please subscribe, follow, review this podcast. Um, any podcast that you listen to that you love, please do that because it helps other people who need to hear the content um, and that who you, you believe would benefit from it. Um, it helps them to find the podcasts. It shows the algorithm that, you know, the podcast is uh, vital and, and important and people need it. So um, please do that so that you don't miss an episode yourself, but also so others can find it as well. So, okay. Now to our guest today, I'm super excited Darren Janelle is with us. He is the founder and CEO of Janelle Group, a 135-person software consulting company headquartered in Schenectady, New York, 
I can say that and I can spell it because it's not far from me um, in the capital region of upstate New York. Darren leads with energy and is obsessed with creating an amazing work environment for his team. Janelle Group has made the Inc. 5000 list seven years in a row and has won multiple best workplace awards for their amazing culture. Darren earned an undergraduate degree in business administration from the University of Albany and a master's degree in information systems from NYU's Stern School of Business. Prior to starting the company in 2005, Darren worked as a software engineer on Wall Street. Darren is happily married and has four children, ages 13 to 23, including two by adoption. Please welcome Darren Janelle. Hey, Darren, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here and and talk about one of my favorite topics. So fired up and ready to go. Awesome. uh, Me too. And I'm just grateful that I have the opportunity to sort of meet you, even though we're meeting online and we're not, we don't, we're kind of still, we're both in the capital region area. I've heard a lot about you. Um, I know you attend Liberty Church. Is that right? That's one of our- Liberty Church in Schenectady. Yep. Yeah. That's our our, um, star care portal church. So I'm so excited Um, for that participation and connection. And for our listeners or viewers who are watching our YouTube channel, um, I see out the window behind you, the great city of Schenectady. Yeah, we love it. We're right here in downtown Schenectady. Uh, This is where our office is. And uh, I also live in downtown Schenectady as well. We've got a heart for Schenectady for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I know your church does as well. So we're excited about that. And yeah. and I'm I'm way upstate today in, in the Adirondacks. So you can see the trees behind me. Beautiful day beautiful. here. Yeah, love it. Love it here. So um, always love to start with our guests' um, adoption story. You are an adopted dad. Um, read that in your bio. So um, I understand your oldest and youngest children are adopted. So what led you and your wife to adoption? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's something that's been always been on both of our hearts from childhood. Um, I, I got saved. I was, uh, I think, uh, 23 years old when I got saved. But so even when I wasn't saved, I grew up and I kind of always felt like I knew I wanted to adopt. Uh, I remember seeing like an after school special where this family adopted a kid from Korea. And I just thought that was so cool. And I mean, I was young, maybe eight, nine years old. I was like, someday I want to do that, you know. And my wife also uh, always thought that as well. So um, this was just maybe something that was in both of us. And maybe it was God's plan all along. You never know, right? And then, uh, you know, after, you know, years, years later, I had been, I gotten, I had gotten saved and then my wife and I were married and had our own birth children. We had two birth sons. Uh, we decided to to give it a go and we've had a really awesome journey through it all. So something that's always been in both of us. Wow. Love that. Love that. And so you have two biological children first yep. and then you decided to pursue adoption. So tell us how that came about. How did, how did your first adopted child come home? Yeah, sure. So, um, so we went through foster care, uh, in Schenectady County. Um, I'm trying to think of how old my sons, my birth sons are two years apart. They're 20 and 18 years old today. They were maybe, maybe six and four when we started this, right? We went through, we took the course through the, um, the foster care course, uh, and then kind of opened up for, for foster care. And our, our goal was always to kind of adopt, even though the goal of foster care is to reunite the children with their birth families. Right. And obviously we would never stand in the way. And, you know, I guess we could get behind that mission as well, but you know, we always kind of felt called to bringing a child in and and making them a part of our family. Uh, So through foster care, we actually got a, a, our first placement, uh, a little girl. She was, uh, um, uh, what was she? Two years old when we got her and she was with us for about a year and kind of going back and forth to the birth family and visits and, and things like that. And eventually she went back to her, her birth family. Right. And that's a, in the in the foster care system, that's a quote unquote success story. For us, it was a bummer though. Like we had really bonded with this little girl, and we thought we gave her a really good uh, environment. But she ended up going back. That was a, a bit of a bummer. Um, but again, we were playing our role in the system, and so then we decided to do it again. And uh, and then my daughter Taya uh, came to us, and uh, it was just so amazing. She was uh, 13 months old. And the day you get your kid, your foster kid, they usually the caseworker just comes and like and drops a kid off, just like you're getting your Chinese food or something like that, right? And it's just such a 
a wild feeling. You know, they kind of hand this kid off. You hang out with the the social worker for 20 minutes and they're like, all right, uh, good luck. We'll call you tomorrow, you know, and you got a new child. And, it, and it's just such a wild uh, time. And my wife and I just fell in love with my daughter from like minute one. She was the cutest little thing sucking on her pacifier and we gave her a bath and fed her and just, she was the sweetest kid. And it was just a perfect glove fit uh, from day one. So uh, that's kind of, that's kind of the story of how she came about. Wow. And then, and then you did it again because you have two adopted children. How did a, a little boy next? Uh, no. Okay. So then uh, she's with us now for, uh, I don't know, five, six years. I should have prepared my timeline before this. Um, but she was with us for a number of years. And my wife and I were thinking and praying about doing again, doing it again. So we were going to go through foster care. But actually, my kids go to McKeel Christian Academy, a small Christian school here in Schenectady. Actually, it's in Scotia. Um, and we love that school. We have a heart for it. And they had a, a, a student here from Nigeria, a kid named Oscar. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was with a like a host family here. And he had a friend named Gideon back in Nigeria. And we got connected with him through the school and we started Skyping, uh, talking to him on Skype. And uh, we decided to host him. Right. So I say he's our adopted son, but he's actually not officially adopted. Uh, we never adopted him. But that's kind of the way we that's the way we are. My wife and I, you come into our family, you're our kid, you know? Um, and so Gideon actually came from Nigeria on his 16th birthday and he flew over first time ever on a plane and we pick him up at Albany airport. And, uh, you know, his whole life was turned upside down. He had never been out of the country. He's from Northern Nigeria and just everything was new to him, right? Mm -hmm. All of the technology and again, first time flying, first time in an elevator, first time with a microwave, first time with an iPhone, you know, just all of the technology. And, and uh, it was just like a really kind of a fun journey, kind of showing him America and exposing him to all this. And, um, also, another glove fit with our family for, for from day one. So he came on his 16th birthday. He's about to turn 24. So he's been with us eight mm -hmm. years. Uh, and actually, he's not even with us anymore. He went to college. He graduated. And he is on his own. Uh, he lives in Pennsylvania. And he's about to get married. And it's just such a such a cool story, you know? Yeah. So now, had he been an orphan in Nigeria and... No, so oh. actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a sidebar. This yeah. is, doesn't have anything to do with uh, um, uh, f um, foster or adoption, but it's a really cool story. So he has parents, uh, mom and dad in Nigeria, who he loves and a great relationship with them, and he has five siblings. And so when he was living with us, a couple of years in, he's he takes a summer job at um, at Jersey Mike's, and he's you know making sandwiches and. You know, he's saving up all his money. He's not really spending his money. And he's working like a dog, 50, 60 hours a week, right? And we're joking with him. We're like, gee, what do you, we call him G, Gideon. Uh, and we're like, gee, what are you doing with all your money, man? You got to be the richest kid in Schenectady. You know, you're going to buy a car. You're going to, you know, you're going to, what are you going to do with all this money? And I'm actually looking on my phone for the photo. Uh, and he goes, actually, I just bought my parents a house. <gasps> and so I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but. He bought this oh, house for his family Wow! and uh, the first house they've ever owned. Wow. He saved up his hard earned money from Jersey Mike's and sent that back to his parents and bought them that home. Wow. And also the next summer he did it again. Well, not another home, but he bought 250 chickens for them so they could sell the eggs. And he's sending, he sent two of his brothers to college. I mean, it's just such an amazing story. And, you know, you talk about somebody mm -hmm. taking the American dream and the opportunity and and working his butt off yeah. to take advantage of that and, and better his family and better himself. It's it's such a cool story, you know? Wow. That that is such a cool what what a what a you know, a young man really with God's favor on him to to put his family first and and to do that. And it's we don't see young men like that very often. And I know one of our adopted sons, our oldest son adopted from Ukraine, we adopted four siblings. Um, and he came when he was nine, almost 10. And mm -hmm. we have an incredible story with him. And he did his, you know, he his birth parents were alive in Ukraine at the time, but he'd been in an orphanage. They had abandoned the, you know, the children and and all of that. So he came from, you know, very difficult background, but what a young man, you know, yeah. just the character and, and just the, the, the drive and the respect and, mm. 
you know, people would comment, you know, compliment us all the time, my husband and I, about what a great job we were doing. And we're like, yeah, no, he came that way. Like, we really didn't have anything to do with it. That's funny. Same thing with Gideon. Yeah. yeah. You're doing such a great job. I'm like, he got off the plane and was respectful and cool and hardworking yeah. and all that. And wow. I just taught him how to use a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, well, that, that is incredible because a lot of times you would, you know, well, if he had, he had good parents, it sounds like, so he had that foundation. So he didn't come from a place of trauma. So many children coming in through the foster care system, or even if it had been an international adoption where there had been, you know, they'd been abandoned or whatever, um, you know, there's trauma and then that just impacts everything about a child and their behavior. So, so at least with your, with your, with your daughter that came in through foster care, did you have any challenges? Was there, was the adjustment difficult? Um, you know, was there trauma? How did you navigate that? There wasn't really trauma with my daughter. You know, she came, you know, her mom struggled with addiction and she came from a tough situation, but it was more of like, maybe like neglect and not, not, at least we don't think there was any like abuse or anything like that. Um, and, so, and she came to us at 13 months. So she was still early enough to, I mean, she's just such a happy, well-adjusted kid. And mm-hmm. so we're really lucked out there. And Gideon's situation, he did, he did, he come, he came from Northern Nigeria and there's actually a ton of violence over there with the Boko yeah. Haram, um, you know, a Muslim extremist group. And there's crazy violence against Christians over there. So he did experience some of that and, you know, has seen the craziest things you could ever imagine. And, mm-hmm. You know, he he doesn't seem to suffer or struggle from that. But again, you never know what's going on in somebody's head. And, I, you know, I, we were always said, do you want to talk to somebody about it? And, I, you know, he, he seems OK with it. But, you know, uh, there hasn't been any like outward, um, um, you know, signs that there's there's really bad trauma there. But I do know that he lived and experienced some crazy yeah. things. You know, wow. it's so heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, so heartbreaking. But just to have that second chance at life and and to be able to come here um, and he gets a second chance, but also was able to invest that second chance into his parents, which is just an incredible, incredible story. I love that. And Um, and Sandra, you know, it's funny. It puts like American or they say this term first world problems. It does put those in perspective, you know, when you're like, oh, my goodness, traffic is so bad or something. It's like, I've never left my town. What are you talking about? Yeah. Like, oh, it took you an extra hour to get to Boston. Wow, you know, like yeah. you're yeah. traveling to a world class city. It, it, I think the addition of Gideon into our family really helped expose all of us, my birth kids, my 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 adopted daughter, my wife and I, to like, oh, put these things in perspective and truly get the what it means to say a first world problem. And so, yeah. you know, I thought that was really cool and, and something good that came out of it. Yeah. And and that ties into a question that I was going to ask about, you know, was there anything um, that about adoption uh, that you didn't expect? Yeah. You know, I think the foster care class that we did through Schenectady County did a really good job of telling stories. And and actually, uh, it kind of makes you nervous. They tell you, uh, like when you did adoption, did you go through foster care and do those courses or you did like, it sounds like international adoption. I don't know if you, did you do any of those yeah. courses? We, we, we did after the fact take the uh-huh. take the maps classes for for foster care but initially our story is, is is different because we we did a kinship placement first so there was no trauma training no nothing to prepare us so we just you know we were biological parents we have these three other kids we know what we're doing you know pat yeah. on the back but then comes this 8 year old little girl who was a relative who had experienced loss and trauma and we didn't understand any of that and yeah. then we adopted internationally many years later after that, after she came, but um, we used an out of state Christian agency. And because they were in a different state, we still had no preparation, no classes, nothing that would educate us in any way to understand the trauma that our kids would come with. So I would say we kind of came in the back door, um, which I don't recommend because you do need to have some, some, some training and some understanding. That training was super eye opening for us and it, it does kind of put the fear of God in you to think, oh my goodness, what are we getting into? And we have tons of friends who've done foster care and adoption and all of that. And we've heard some, some tough, challenging stories. I got to be honest, like we were, we've just really lucked out with that. Um, And we haven't had to deal with much of that. Again, Gideon has had that in his life, but it hasn't really manifested itself. And so um, yeah, just kind of like, I guess, blind luck that we've kind of avoided that. Um, you know, it's just such a, um, we, 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 that's one thing that surprised us is we actually didn't bump into a lot of that. 
Um, and maybe some of it will come later in life. I don't, I don't really know, but uh, we've been lucky up to this point. Yeah. So, so how old are the kids now? I know you mentioned Gideon a little bit being in his twenties now, but how old are they both now and how are they doing? What are they up to? Yeah. So, so again, Gideon uh, graduated college. So cool. Um, he went to McKeel Christian Academy here was, he was a very good basketball player. They won a state championship. It was one of the coolest, like, uh, seasons of my life and the whole school and the family followed the team as they won a state title. That was awesome. And then he went to a a small Christian school in PA. Maybe you've heard of it. Clark summit used to be known as BBC Baptist Bible college. Uh, unfortunately that closed, that school just closed, uh, which is a, a bummer, but he went to school there for four years, graduated, and he's still working at Jersey Mike's, but he's like a manager. He's running stores. Um, they're going to sponsor his visa, which is really cool. Because he's actually, again, even though we call him our son, he's not legally our son. So he's still here on a student visa and, and he's figuring out his work visa. And he's been in the country eight years now. So he's trying to get his green card. Um, and so hopefully we can get all of that buttoned up. Um, and he's just doing he's just doing fantastic. Uh, and my daughter is now 14. So she's been with us basically all her life. I mean, and she uh, she looks just like us, even though she's uh, she's a hundred percent Puerto Rican. She looks exactly like my wife and I. And they go, "Oh, your daughter looks just like you." You know, we don't correct anyone or say anything, but it's just kind of funny how I think she was meant to be with us from from day one. Uh, and she's a diehard Taylor Swift fan, and she just saved up. $1,300. And it was like a year long thing. She worked her butt off to do it. And we went over to Germany to see Taylor Swift in concert and all of that. Wow. So really cool uh, experience. And she's just doing so well. She's at McKeel Christian, happy kid. We have such a great relationship with her. Um, and it just, it couldn't be going better really, Sandra. Wow. That's, that's exciting. Cause so many of our families, I know, I know some of our listeners are probably saying what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, right. You got lucky, right? And yeah. I did, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. but you know, we love that. And, and, and we've got that, you know, my husband and I are, are parents of five adopted kids. So, wow. you know, we have a couple that, you know, I would say, yeah, lucky, right. That they, they just clicked into our family. No, you know, it wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. And then others just had more significant trauma, um, you know, and, and, and the like. So we navigate yeah. all of it, but you know, so many, so many families that are listening are struggling, but yet we, you know, we need that hope that it can be okay and that it will work out. So I love that. Um, you know, that Sandra, you know, what we transitioned into a little bit too, is, uh, we've got a big old house, one of these old antique houses in Schenectady. And so a lot of rooms and, we like to think of our house as an open house. So now we're not doing like adoption or foster, but we're bringing kids in, you know, whether it's Gideon's friends coming and staying for a summer or um, my son did some traveling and stayed with a family in Brazil and their daughter comes and stays with us. She's been with us three times now for, you know, months at a time. And uh, I don't think we're done with that. I, I think there is going, our house is going to be a revolving door of, uh, you know, maybe now a little bit older, like college age or high school age students and transfer students and foreign exchanges and all of that. And that that has been a really um, rewarding experience. The reason I bring that up is if there's people in your audience that maybe haven't pulled the trigger or maybe hesitant, that might be a good way to test the waters, right? Get a foreign exchange student for a year, right? See how that works. Can I put up with a 16-year-old Spanish girl, you know, who wants to go to school for a year in America? You know, and then you kind of see how do we do at bringing someone in and, and opening our doors and does it feel natural? That might be a good baby step um, into it. I don't. I don't know if that's relevant or not, but I thought. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, and 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 respite even you know for yeah. folks who are who are you know not sure you know or or even not done you know there's some, some families have adopted and then you know they they want to open their home and they want to do more they just don't know you know what's going to be a good fit um, you know lots of different ways that we can invest into the lives of children yeah. you know your story definitely is evidence of that. Um, Darren, you know, you're, you know, being, being a husband, a dad, a successful businessman, um, how has adoption, um, or even investing, you know, into the lives of children that, you know, weren't biologically yours, how, how has that changed you in any way or yeah. has it changed you in any way? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it's just, it's taught me, um, it's taught me, I guess, empathy for others, right? I can remember when I was young, I mentioned, oh, when I was young, I want, always wanted to adopt. And uh, maybe this makes me sound like a horrible person, but I'll say it anyway. I remember in high school, we had these foreign exchange students from France. I think they were from France. 
And they just were different than us. Their clothes were different. They didn't use deodorant. I just remember going like, oh, these people, like, you know, it was just so uh, uh, the opposite of empathy and just like, you know, it just wasn't, a, I wasn't in a good, good place. This was pre-Christian days too. Um, and, you know, then over time, as you grow and you mature and you realize, you know, oh my gosh, I was being so, um, you know, so naive and just ignorant and, I think, you know, this experience and seeing different families and different people's stories and struggles, it's really just opened my eyes to, you You got to, the world is so much bigger than you and your experiences and all of your worldviews. Your worldview is your worldview because of what you've seen in your experience. There are billions of people and there are billions of different situations. And I just think getting exposure to those different things, like I didn't know things about families from Northern Nigeria, right? And now I'm almost a, a little bit of an expert on the subject, right? Because I've been exposed to that. And so I think that's been really helpful in in helping me become more uh, empathetic and, uh, you know, hopefully more Christ-like, but and I got a lot of work to do still, but I think that would be uh, the, the main way it's impacted me. Yeah, I, I would have to say a similar, you know, similar thing for myself, even because, you know, we, we go in, you know, we entered this, you know, the Lord called us to, to adopt these children and we're going to change their lives, right. For the better. And then my husband and I are like, I think we're the ones that were changed for the better, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and really it, it grows your faith, um, in the Lord and, and, and just, um, is, is, you know, part of that transforming, um, you know, transformation that we should all be experiencing and, and growing as believers. So, I love you, that. You see the world too, right? Again, we've done a lot of international stuff, right? Gideon's from Nigeria. Um, you know, our foster ki kids were through America, but you know, the girls staying with us from Brazil, we've had kids stay with us from China. We've had other kids from Africa stay with us, right? Um, kids from the islands. And, and it's just, as you see these different cultures and everything, I think it's been really good for my kids growing up right yeah. now. My, my two birth sons, they've both traveled the world. They've probably both been in, I don't know, over 20 countries, right? Or certainly my oldest one, the other one. My other kid, 18 years old, just graduated high school and traveled through Europe by himself for 35 days, right? Wow. I don't think he does that if he hasn't been living with all of these different people from all over the world, realizing people are people and it's just yeah. different cultures and different places. And I think they become more comfortable as maybe like world citizens as opposed to just, you know, all about America. And we do love America in our house. Yeah. I do. We love America, but I'm a citizen of the world, yeah. you know, maybe even more so than uh, of America, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that what heaven's going to be like, right? Yes. It's, yeah. There's you know, no, hopefully there's no countries unless we're having some good sports matches. Or something <laughs> up there. I, don't, I don't know. Who knows? Right? <laughs> we'll find out. We will find out when we get yeah. there. Uh, so, so Darren, you chose the verse that we opened with today. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Um, what does Isaiah 117 mean to you? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I struggle with the Bible when it's not so literal, you know, uh, and I love this one because it is so literal, right? And it just clearly uh, walks you through, right? This is how to live, right? I mean, we should be seeking justice, right? There are people out there that need help in and, uh, you know, need people to go to bat for them. And that's my role here. That is my wife's role. That's actually each and every person on earth. I believe that's our role. Um, but I'm going to take my responsibility and I'm going to try to do my part. Are you and I, Sandra, going to fix the world? Definitely not. But if we put our heart and soul into this one child, we can change that child's world. And then, yeah. hey, maybe we can do that again. And maybe we can do that again, right? And sometimes I struggle with, and I give you props, it sounds like you've done multiple children, kind of where do you draw that line? Like, oh, I did my part. Well, maybe I should do more, right? And that's probably a struggle that uh, I know I know both my wife and I are kind of uh, dealing with. Um, um, I'm getting off topic on on the the verse, but I love that verse because it's so uh, it's so literal. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, and you did for one, like your Nigerian son and you invested in his life and then the ripple effect, because then he invested in his family, his parents back in Nigeria, you yeah. know, and then even, even purchasing all those chickens, right. That's going to transform not just his, that their family, but the community there, Yeah, you know, so there is that ripple effect. So, is so um, cool. and yeah, we're all like, 
anyone in life, no matter what your situation is, and certainly if you're blessed, like really blessed, like I feel like I have, seems like you have as well. Like we're, I'm most 99% of my blessings aren't my own doing, right? You could even argue 99.9 .9 because any of the things I quote unquote worked for or did on my own, well, I did on my own because I had all of these other things that were given to me, right? And so when you kind of like put it through that lens, well, these other people don't have that. Shouldn't we try our best to, to, to share what we have been blessed with and kind of pass that on or, you know, pay that forward, you know? Yeah. I love that. And, and that sort of ties into, cause, cause I, I agree, like, you know, we, we adopted five altogether, but in, you know, with, with running the ministry, running, you know, JFO and doing what we're doing, it was like, I felt like, you know, I said to my husband, I think we need to also do foster care now. And we took the foster care classes and we had already, you know, we already have five adopted children. And, um, and then some things happened, you know, I, I, my mom became terminally ill and I had to take care of her. And then we didn't have an empty bed because a couple of kids hadn't left for college yet. And it just seemed like the door to foster care for us wasn't opening. And then, you know, my husband, you know, we sat down one day and, and he said, you know, maybe we're not supposed to take in more kids. Maybe we're supposed to just continue to do what we're doing through the ministry, through JFO, because we can help more families. Yeah. And then we're helping more kids, you know, and then it was not long after that, that care portal came along and we started doing that. And then the impact, you know, by, you know, partnering with all of the churches, I think we've got like 80 churches throughout the capital region that we're working with and just the, that multiplication in investing in the lives of children and families and changing lives that way. So there's so many different ways that we can invest yeah. into the lives of children and change their lives, their family, and ultimately their community. Uh, that's awesome. And I love what you said about maybe we're not supposed to do this, right? My wife and I both struggle with, you know, a lot of Christians are like, God spoke to me. And, and I struggle with that. Like, well, what are you, are you sure? Or that's just what you wanted to do. What we do is we pray about it. God, I don't know if you're speaking or not, but what I'm asking you to do is open doors, close doors, put the, let the cards or the chips fall where they may to where you want it to go. And we'll try our best to follow the signs that we see. Yeah. Right. And if then we get a call and the kid says, Hey, I need a place to live. And you go, wait, I just prayed that. And now this is happening. My, my, you know, some non-believers will go, well, that's just coincidence. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I believe it happens to be God and God is answering our prayer and opening doors, closing doors, letting this happen or not happen. And my wife and I are just trying our best to navigate and, you know, go through uh, the path passages that uh, God opens for us, you know? Yeah. And that's our role is to be obedient to whatever, you know, if the door opens, step through, trusting that the Lord opened it and he'll be there to equip us for yeah. whatever is on the other side. Right. So it's just, it's, it's being willing to be obedient. Sometimes we say putting our yes on the table, you know, yeah. whatever the Lord, whatever you want to do, Lord. Yeah. Yes. You know, just yeah. be with us in it and through it. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So Darren, our listeners are primarily foster and adoptive parents, you know, like us and, and caring for kids and investing in kids. So as we wrap up, would you share some words of encouragement for our listeners on this parenting journey? Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, again, I, I think of uh, my role as a husband and father as my number one role in, on earth. Right. And so I just think of it as just such a blessing that we get this opportunity to do this. Is it always easy? <laughs> Definitely not. I kind of, as I told my story, I made it seem like, oh, it's perfect. And this is great. And this is great. You know, it's not all perfect. And certain people are definitely dealing with more, uh, more struggles than, than we are, but this is an opportunity, right? And I'm a big believer in positive thinking and, and kind of repetition and continue to have the discipline to pray on this and continue to, I believe this is a negative word. A lot of people think brainwash yourself. This is what we're here to do. Continue to remind yourself. And if you're listening to this, take this as a reminder. Maybe it's God speaking through me. Maybe I'm just a lunatic and I'm speaking, but we are supposed to do this. Take courage, mm -hmm. keep pushing, keep fighting. This is what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to just live off the fat of the land and float around and retire and hang out and chill. That's not what we're supposed to do. God put us here to do this work and I'm going to try to step up and do my part. Right. And, and I just, I, I love like kind of that type of, of talk and thinking I'm a sports guy. So I love the motivational stuff. Um, 
And, and this is what we're here to do and get around a bunch of other people that are also in the same boat. It's so much easier, right? When you've got some other friends that are maybe quote unquote in the struggle with you and uh, you know, going through some stuff and, and you can share experiences and pray up together. And uh, you know, that, that has been really helpful for us to, to kind of partner with others who are in the same journey. So a little bit of motivation for me at the end, uh, I'm a high energy guy and I love kind of talking that way. Oh, well, thank you so much for the encouragement. I know our listeners are, will be encouraged by your story and by your message. And and Darren, thank you for all that you're doing there in Schenectady and, and in, in your church um, and, and on behalf of children uh, and kids and college age kids and for investing in them. So thank you so much for being with us today. Sandra, same back to you. You're doing amazing work. It's so cool to see what you're up to. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. And this was a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. What a great conversation with Darren Janelle. I hope that you were encouraged and motivated by uh, his story and his message at the end there. Um, that's what we want to do here. We want to encourage you so um, and equip you, of course, for your parenting journey. So thank you so much um, for listening today uh, and, and uh, let your adoptive and your fellow adoptive and fostering and kinship caregiving friends know about this podcast um, and know about our training. Uh, again, always want to circle back around and, and reiterate that, you know, we have all of those resources for parents and caregivers and even professionals who are working with children who are prenatally exposed to alcohol or other drugs. Um, we have the support group, the training, uh, and the, um, the support group, the training, and this podcast, of course, uh, and you can check out all of our resources on our website, justicefororphansny.org, and my personal uh, website where my blog lives, sandraflack.com. Be sure to find and follow us on social media. Justice for Orphans is on both Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and we have our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this podcast, you'll be able to see the picture of the house that Darren showed earlier in our conversation. Um, you can watch it on our YouTube channel, and that is at Justice for Orphans. Uh, and follow us on all those platforms. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. You spent your valuable time. I hope you were encouraged. Um, thank you for being with us on this journey. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Adoption and Foster Care Journey podcast brought to you by Justice for Orphans. We hope you were encouraged today. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a review and share it with your fellow foster and adoptive parent friends so they can be encouraged too. Be sure to find and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Justice for Orphans. And check out our website for vital resources at justicefororphansny.org.